Today on Between the Lines, becoming the person you want to be with one of the world's most respected business coaches, Marshall Goldsmith. Welcome, I'm Barry Kibrick. Marshall has advised the leading corporate executives from the most well-known companies across the globe. With his book, Triggers, he reveals how we all can overcome obstacles to enact meaningful and lasting change in our lives. I'm a writer today because I was a reader when I was 11 years old, and it was... You do, need to, need, you do not need to prove your state of happiness to anybody. Most of these speeches were as much as a month in preparation. The characters, the heroes in this book, are seekers of truth in, in a story that, that involved a lot of corruption. I don't get a chance to really talk about what's real, and that is the first thing to do. Marshall, welcome to Between the Lines. It is a pleasure and honor to have you here on the show. Thank you so much for inviting me. You know, I, 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 I'm laughing now because, you know, we just, right before the cameras rolled, I said, no, don't say that. That's the first thing I'm going to talk about. What this is, and that's what we are going to talk about, is you, you really are a specialist when it comes to, you know, executive coaching and, and counseling of the biggest CEOs in the world. And this book, though, is really written for the rest of us as well. It is. And, and it really is, because what it's about is the ability for us as adults to change our behavior. And what I was about to say to you, which is what you just said to me was, but that's so hard. It's not a matter of knowing what to do. It's in getting it in that structure of our own being that we do it. That's where the difficulty comes. That's the bridge that you're trying to cross. That's the gap that you want to fill in with triggers. Exactly. We mentioned my friend Jim Kuzas. He wrote a book 25 years ago on how to be a great leader. The book has been revalidated over and over and over again. People know what to do. Here's my theory. If I interviewed you or almost anybody I meet, and I said, describe the perfect you, the ideal you, the you you want to be, you'd write a beautiful story. You don't need me to tell you who you want to be. Everybody can do that. The problem is not that we can't figure out who we should be. The problem is we don't become this person. I mean, New Year's resolutions don't get met. You know, people are disengaged. There's a huge gap between I understand and I do. And what I found important that you let people know here is that is not due to a lack of their own willpower necessarily. That is not due to even their own emotional or mental state. It are oftentimes are these triggers right. that are sometimes outside of your control. You, they may feel that they're a part of you. Well, uh, why can't I lose the weight I right, wanted right, to right, lose? Right. I know exactly what I do. Right. But we have triggers that throughout our growth, throughout our own environment, throughout our own family, whatever they may be, we're triggered sometimes to not do what we know we're supposed to do. Uh, I did a study called Leadership as a Contact Sport. 86,000 people. I'm probably the only guy you've ever met who actually is a teacher who's measured, do people do what I teach and do they get better? And the people that do what I teach get better and the ones, shockingly, that do nothing don't improve. And so I was working at Johnson & Johnson with their top 2,000 leaders, and 98% of the leaders said they were going to do what I taught them in the class. A year later, 70% did something, and 30% did zero. So I said, why'd you do nothing? Their answers had nothing to do with ethics, values, or integrity. They won an award, most ethical company in the world. They're good people. They're smart people. Why didn't they do anything? They had a dream. It sounded like this. I'm incredibly busy right now, given pressures of work and home and new technology that follows me everywhere, and emails and voicemails. I'm as busy as I ever have been. In fact, sometimes I'm overcommitted. Every now and again, my life feels out of control. But you know, I'm working on some very unique and special challenges right now. And I think the worst of this is going to be over in four or five months. And after that, I'm going to take two or three weeks and get organized and spend time with the family and begin my new healthy life program. And it won't be crazy anymore. I always ask people, how many of you have had this dream? Everybody's oh, yeah. had the same stupid I thought, in fact, what did you, you, don't, you don't even sleep near me, Marshall, so what the? <laughs> People are amazed. I, I know their dreams. Well, you know, but, but this is what you, you, you give us a, you, you have empathy for us, let's put it that way, because what you say is that these triggers that we have, they're not in by themselves necessarily bad or good. They don't right. have a value judgment, but what matters is how are we going to respond 
to them. That's the key. And even that requires a bridge of some sort and a gap to be filled in. And it's easy in theory and hard in practice. Yeah. I'll give you a case study. Oh, your, gosh. Are please. you ready? I'm, not only am I ready, I'd lie down if you were a PhD. <laughs> if you, I know actually you have your doctorate even. I feel comfortable. Go Here's ahead, the case Doc, study. tell me. Now, do you believe companies should encourage people to tell the truth? I, I would say, yes. you know, outside of a white lie when it's necessary, yeah. sure. And punishing the messenger, punishing those people that try to help you, wouldn't that be a bad idea? I would think so. A terrible idea. Just I agree. Awful idea. All right. We're going to do a case study with you. You've had a hard day at work, a hard day. You go home, your husband, wife, friend, or partner's there. You get in the car to go to the store. You're driving to the store. Lots of traffic. Cars are cutting in front of you. People are honking their horns. The person on the front seat goes, look out, there's a red light up ahead. Did you say, thank you? Or perhaps something that sounded like, what do you mean there's a red light? Don't you think I can see? I don't drive this car. Well, almost everyone I work with, what did they do? Plan B. And then I ask them why. Well, a trigger. Yeah. The trigger goes off, they have an impulse and they have a reaction. And that the trigger controls their logic and sanity, so they behave in an insane way that in hindsight they didn't want to behave that way. And you even make it more comp, not, no, I'm sorry, you make it more easier to understand, but you realize that the situation is more complex because since the environment, and when I mean environment, I don't mean planetary environment, right, right. the environment that, as you mean, that we, we are brought up in and things like that. It itself is not static. Right. So it's constantly changing, right. and you've got these old triggers, new triggers, whatever they might be. It's really hard to keep, keep it together. I mean, it is. It is very hard. And one thing I talk about in the book is the high probability of low probability distractions. Because we never plan on a low probability distraction. You don't plan on somebody dying or getting your leg broken or a car wreck. Could you say it's a low probability? There are a million low probability distractions could occur. And while the odds on one occurring may be small, the odds on something happening are almost certain. Now you do talk though about internal triggers that can also shape our, our thoughts and, and behavior and regret. Regret. All right. <laughs> we replay what actually, we were supposed to do against what actually happens, right. but we've got to stop that regret. We must stop that spiraling into that shame, right. that spiraling into regret. And again, easy for us to talk about, but once you start, that is the hardest thing to get out of because it's building upon itself. Right. And we're so ashamed to need help. We're ashamed to ask for help. We're ashamed to need help. The leader I work with, I think, is a role model for how to not create the wrong environment, but to create the right environment, our friend Alan Mulally, the guy that turned Ford around. He was ranked number three great leader in the world last year behind the Pope and Angela Merkel. He goes to Ford, they're bankrupt. You know what he says? Red, yellow, green. Green, top five priorities. Green is good, yellow, caution, red, bad. Company's losing $17 billion. Everyone says green. He goes, uh, uh, uh. We're losing 17 billion and everyone's on plan. I guess our plan must be to lose 17 billion. He says, this isn't so good. Finally, somebody says red. You know what he says? He applauds. Thank you for having the courage to admit you have a problem and you don't have a solution and it's okay. I don't, you're not gonna solve a problem because I yell at you. Well, then they just hide the problem. Alan says, if you have a problem and you don't have a solution, it's okay, you don't have to be ashamed. Let's put it on the table, let's work together and make it better. In fact, if you do, you will together find the solution. And that's what happened. And well, if not, as my friend says, it's not really a problem. That's right. Well, <laughs> and the stock went from one to 1840, so they found a lot of solutions. Yeah. Yeah. Now though, there, as you said though, there still is that difference between understanding and doing. And one of the things that you feel almost, I shouldn't say, I think it's even stronger. Not that you feel, you know that if you put some structure right. into it, Right. You don't even need to be disciplined to make the change if you follow the structure. A couple of examples. In my own coaching process, again, I have a simple system. I don't get paid if my clients don't get better. I work with them a year and a half. 18 people measure, they improve. They get better, I get paid. They don't, it's all free. I have a very clear structure they follow, which pretty much always works. And by the way, I can give your listeners a structure that takes two minutes a day, that costs nothing, and it's gonna help them get better at almost anything. And you know what some of them are thinking right now? Yeah, right, sure, they're highly skeptical. Half the people I teach this to quit within two weeks. And they don't quit because it does not work. They quit because it does work. 
It's easy to understand and it's hard to do. That's the daily question process. And the way it works is pretty simple. Get out an Excel spreadsheet, write a list of questions that represent what's important in your life. Everyone is answered with a yes, no, or number. Fill it out every day and at the end of the week you get a Excel spreadsheet gives you a report card. And I always teach people, if you're in a big company, that report card at the end of the week may not be quite as pretty as that corporate values plaque stuck up on the wall. Because when you do this every day, you learn life is incredibly easy to talk and hard to live. So now, if my viewers are able to do this, what do we owe you? <laughs> <laughs> Send me an email, marshall at marshallgoldsmith.com. And you know what they owe me? Wait, say it again. Give out your Marshall, website. two L's, at marshallgoldsmith.com. Send me an email and say thanks. That makes me feel good. Ah, wonderful, wonderful. And just as you did that, one of the key things that you, you, that structure gives you because you know you need this help is just what you did there, yeah. humility. That's right. You say that when we have this humility, that gives us a greater opportunity to be a leader. We usually find, we think of leaders as, as, as being, you know, without humility, with, right. you know, just forge forward, go, go, right. go like that. But it, the, the truly great leaders from history have that humility that allows them to, to probe deeper into right. not only others, but into themselves. Right, and get help. You don't have to always give the help. My friend Alan seldom gave suggestions. He said, just because I'm the CEO of Ford, why do I assume I know more than everyone else in the entire company? Why should I assume I know more than everyone else? You have a problem. Why should I know the solution just because I'm the CEO? There are a lot of smart people here, probably many smarter than me. I'll give you an example in my own life. I pay a woman to call me on the phone every night. Every night she listens to me read 29 questions that I wrote and provide 29 answers that I wrote every day. I do this. Somebody said, why do you pay a woman to call you on the phone? Don't you know the theory about how to change behavior? I said, I wrote the theory about how to change behavior. That's why I pay a woman to call me. I know how hard it is. If I had the courage and discipline to do it by myself, I would. I don't. My name is Marshall Goldsmith. I need help, and it's okay. You know, the problem that, you see how you just answered that? One of the things you bring out, though, is that there's almost an inner fear that if a person admits that, right. that if a person says, I need change, they will then lose their authentic self. Uh, you know, that's a really, and I believe that that's a deep uh, uh, em emotional situation. Totally deep. Um, one of the people I coach has a simultaneous MD and PhD from Harvard in anthropology in five years. I interviewed him in our first coaching session. At an hour, I took notes, I said, in the last hour, you've told me how smart you were six times. I read them all back to him. And I said, I'm a little slow. I read your bio. I know you're smart. You didn't have to do that. He was so embarrassed. How deep of a drive do you have to prove you're smart to get a simultaneous MD from Harvard and PhD in anthropology in five years? How deep is that crap? And you think it goes away when they give you the degrees? They don't have enough degrees. It's very hard for us to get over this over and over stuff. You say, in fact, the great Western uh, disease is, I'll be happy when. When I get the money status BMW condominium, I will be happy when the great Western art form. There is a person. They have a problem. They're sad. They spend money, they buy a product, and they become happy. It's called a commercial. I don't know if you've ever seen one before, but they're very prevalent. Not on this station, you <laughs> That's <won't. good>. That's <laughs> They're very prevalent in our society. And, and we grow up with this myth that, you know, I'll be happy when. You know, well, there, there is no when. But you also, because of this, it is due to what you call feedback, the feedback that, that we continuously get. And you say feedback, and this is interesting to me, is both the act of giving it and taking it. You even call it a feedback loop right. that is required in order for us to really benefit by giving and taking feedback. And it's not a one-time event. It's an over and over and over again process. I'm not a believer in the quick fix and the you know instant salvation kind of theory of change. If you go to the Saturday night, uh, Saturday morning TV, click. You know, I spend. I just spent a little money and I bought this machine, and it costs almost nothing and it took no time at all. And then after two weeks, I looked just like Cindy Crawford. <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe not. <laughs> That would require more than a machine, Marshall. <laughs> For you and me, just a little bit more. <laughs> well, but you, you also, uh, this is one I want to actually quote directly, because yeah. I think it, it really uh, will help 
and at least it helped me. Sure. Whether you're leading other people, and these are the words, or leading the follower in you, the obstacles to achieving your goals are the same. And I love that, that follower in you, because that's the first person we're gonna have to be leading, isn't it? And we don't think that way. We assume the leader or the planner is the same as the follower, wrong. That planner that's planning to go on that healthy foods diet is not that uh, doer that's sitting there hungry, staring at the chocolate cake. The planner is not the person making the sacrifice. The doer makes the sacrifice. And when we make plans, we assume that the planner or the leader in us is the same as the doer or the follower in us. Very bad assumption. Wow. And, and, and when you realize that, you get clarity just from that notion itself. And you get over this need that you never need help because you realize, yeah, I don't need help at eight o'clock in the morning when I'm not tired, but at six in the afternoon or seven in the afternoon after I work 12 hours and I'm exhausted, I may need a little help here, and you know, it's okay. We joked earlier, I said I, I was writing a book, and it, in one of my chapters I, I, I labeled this thing, and, and I, I called it the cha-cha of life, and you have something very similar in it, and it's because we take one step forward, right. one step back, two steps to the side, right. two steps to the side, one step forward. It never goes linear, and no. that's what people, I think, really get stopped by the most, is that they feel, well, once I make this awareness, I'm supposed to have this awareness, go, yeah, exactly, right. it's gonna go only in one direction, and it doesn't. We fall back, we fall to the sides. We, it's, the only thing we can possibly do is just get up again and try again, or move, it, not even try again, do again. I'd rather do, say those words than try again. Yeah. I'd do it again. Day after day. Day after day. Day after day. Yeah. Eliminating is the most liberating therapeutic action, according to you, but we make it reluctantly. Right. Now, you haven't been to my house, so I don't know how you realize <laughs> that. Uh, I have, we have boxes from the first move we ever made still right. unpacked and, and in that position. It's difficult to get rid of your boxes or your baggage. Very difficult, and my, one of my books, What Got You Here Won't Get You There, the reason it was a popular book, and talk about what to quit doing, what to stop. Well, all of us, if you look at the model uh, Wheel of Change I talk about, we look at creating as a positive thing, which is the new me I want to create, yet we also need to preserve. Well, if we just create new stuff and we preserve the old stuff, we run out of space. You have to eliminate to create. There really, in the long term, is no creation without elimination. If we just keep creating and never eliminate, what do you get? Your house is, looks like a hoarder. And what else happens is you're overcommitted. The people I work with in life, almost everyone I meet today, I say, how many of you feel as busy or busier than you've ever felt in your lives? Almost everybody. Why? We don't eliminate. Well, you say, though, you have this word here, accepting is the rare bird in this aviary of change. So even if we don't eliminate, we mm -hmm. have to be kind, have to accept, and still eliminate the next day if we make that list, have some, you know, right. have that person call you, whatever it is required right. that you need to do. But you have to accept. Accepting for many of us is hard. I'm a Buddhist, and to me, a lot of Buddhism is learning about acceptance. And I have a, a little question in the book I love. Uh, am I willing at this time to make the investment required to make a positive difference on this topic? If the answer is yes, do it. If the answer is no, take a deep breath and let it go. I had the privilege of being on the Peter Drucker advisory board for 10 years. He said, our mission in life is to make a positive difference, not to prove how smart we are and not to prove how right we are. Well, most of us don't understand that. We get so lost in proving we're smart or right, we forget, why am I doing this? Why? And when we do forget, you say there's a magic move, and it's called apologizing. Right. Apology is where behavioral change begins. I have always felt a strong relationship with the word apology because right. you, you almost, obviously if you overdo anything, right. everything is within moderation, but it's, it's so liberating right. to apologize and then move on. Well, you know what? We all make mistakes. It's okay. And what should I do when I make a mistake? Apologize, and if I feel like blaming someone for my mistakes, who is probably the best person for me to blame for my mistakes? That would be me. 
I'm proud of something in the book. 27 CEOs endorsed that book. These are very successful people. Coaching used to be something that was seen as for losers. If you had a coach, that meant you must have problems or something wrong with you. You must be a kind of loser. Well, if you look at those names, they're not losers. They're all big winners. What I love about what I've really tried to do for 30 years is create an environment that says it's okay to ask for help. It doesn't mean you're a loser. It means you're a smart person who's trying to get better. What I love about 27 people, they all ask for help, and they're not ashamed to put their name on the book and say they ask for help. Well, you know, you also, the help they ask you, you take it even a step further. It's not only those daily questions that you say, but you break them down if you really need to on an hourly basis. And, and literally, that is how it can almost become habitual. Right. And, you know, I talk in the book about the active questions, which I love. That came from my daughter, Kelly. Uh, my daughter, Kelly's a professor at the Kellogg School of Northwestern, so this came from her. And she taught me about active questions, and they all start with, did I do my best to? And one of them is be happy and find meaning and build relationships and be engaged. And I have a case study using my classes. I say, imagine you had to go to a boring meeting, stupid PowerPoint slides, you don't want to go, you're dreading, it's going to last for an hour. Then I ask people, now imagine at the end of the meeting, if you're going to ask one of these four questions, did I do my best to be happy, find meaning, uh, build relationships and be engaged? Give me one thing you do different. I've asked 100,000 people this question. Everyone has told me things they do different. No one said I do nothing different. Then you know what I say? Do that. Oh. You know why? That meeting, that's your life. The real loser in that meeting is not the company or the customer. If you're bitter, cynical, angry for that hour, it's your hour. You just wasted one hour of your life. Here's a message that, and, and I think, and again, I looked at those CEOs that wrote about this. They are from the biggest companies in the world. And yet, this is right near the end of the book. And you would think that none of them would feel this way. And that is the words, good enough. Right. Sometimes, good enough is really good enough. Right. And sometimes it's not. <laughs> and that's what's the decision. When is good enough good enough? And when is good enough not good enough? And I think that goes back to regret. Look at what's really important in your life. If it's really important, then maybe that good enough isn't good enough. If it's something that's not that critical to your future, it's not part of who you want to be, good enough could be more than good enough. It still requires integrity, virtue and character. I can't, it's, it's bizarre that so many people now are finally, I'm, I'm right. thankful of realizing that because when you don't put those things in front of everything else, right. everything else falls by the wayside. You know, even if you do have integrity and character, it still takes discipline. Let me give you a case study from the book. Well, wait. Or structure, am I correct? Structure. structure, because structure, as you say, you can you can use it without even the discipline if you if you if you structure it. Correctly. If you have enough structure, it'll help you. Why do I do what I do? Because I need help. I'm not ashamed of it. You need that kind of structure, and we we almost all do. I, I'll speak for myself. I need help. Most of my I, I I have a thing I do in class. I say, how many of you need to be a better listener? I did this last night. Some guy raised his hand. I said, how many years have you been needing to be a better listener? He said, oh, about forty. I said, raise your hand and repeat after me. My name is John. I have not been improved on being a listener for 40 years. It's highly unlikely I will get better by myself next week. My name is John. I need help, and it's okay. <laughs> Why should we believe if we haven't done something for 40 years, we're going to start getting better next week? You're not going to get better next week. Get some help, and it's okay. Don't be ashamed. It's okay. Was it? I think it was in your book. Now I have to remember, because was it in your book where, yes, it was, it was. Uh, corporate executives, I know that. They play golf all the time, oh, yeah, and that's yeah, what yeah. they do. And there was one guy that came to you with a problem where he said, you know, Marshall, if I had, you asked yeah. him that question, what yeah. is it that you want to do? And he said, I want to improve my golfing as right. I grow up. And, and, you, said, had, and you had to say, but, but the reason is that you're 58 years old. Now right. you may still want to be as good a golfer as you can at 58, but look at Tiger Woods is not as good a golfer as he was at 24. Well, of course that's he, you not going to happen. <laughs> and it's okay. Why don't you just go have some fun? Just go out there and have some fun, right? And in fact, it was taking away the time that he thought was important. From spending it with his wife. From yeah, exactly. his family. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Marshall, 
well, obviously not only I, but 26 of the biggest executives in the world can talk to you forever. And I did not have to pay, even though I <laughs> am benefiting tremendously. I am going to end with your words, though. Fate is the hand of cards we've been dealt. Choice is how we play the hand. Thank you, Marshall, for helping us become better card players. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure. And thank you guys for joining us. Now, before Marshall leaves, I'd like to leave you with these few more words from Triggers. When we dive all the way into adult behavioral change with 100% focus and energy, we become an irresistible force rather than the proverbial immovable object. We begin to change our environment rather than be changed by it. The people around us sense this and we have become the trigger. I'm Barry Kibrick. Between our internal behavior and our environment is the power inside us all to become the trigger we need to pull. Thank you so much, Marshall. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Closed captioning for Between the Lines with Barry Kibrick is made possible by your generous contributions to KLCS Education Foundation. Thank you for your support. To connect with Barry, like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at Barry Kibrick. And to contact Barry directly, watch past episodes of Between the Lines, and read his blog, visit us at barrykibrick.com.